looking for him for his daughter who was going to be applying to attend a very exclusive college and when he came to a question on the form which asked whether the applicant was a leader or not well in all honesty he had to write down no she's not but she's a good follower and the application was sent in a month later a letter arrived notifying him that his daughter had been accepted and at the bottom of the page the dean had written since the entering class of 500 has 499 leaders we thought there ought to be room for one follower a young woman gives birth to a blind son she thinks you know i don't want him to know that he is challenged in this way of being blind i do not want my child to know that uh, he is blind and so she forbade all of the family members and the neighbors to speak about telltale words such as color and light and sight and so this little boy grew up unaware of his disability until one day a strange girl jumped over the fence of the garden and spoiled everything by using all of the forbidden words of light and color and sight and his world just shattered in the face of the reality of the truth you know Jesus is that otherworldly voice that comes to us and tells us the truth about things Jesus if he is anything is utterly truth isn't he he is true there is no hypocrisy there is no guile in his thinking or in his words now our country our culture is divided over truth or whether the people should be lied to not since the Vietnam War probably not since the American Civil War has this nation and its leaders been more bitterly divided over what is the truth but heaven sent Jesus Christ to bring peace on earth and goodwill toward men and anyone who is concerned about the first angel's message which is our moniker as Seventh-day Adventists in Revelation 14 verse 6 where it says that we have given the everlasting gospel to preach to all of the world anyone who takes that seriously can't help can't help but desire the clearest understanding of the gospel of all that Jesus has to give to us so that we can proclaim to the world the truth about the Savior we hear the phrase often in our culture well everybody does it and so you know truth and honesty and integrity don't matter it's just what you believe that's truth everybody does it and so fidelity and honesty we are told in our culture around us is just an unattainable morality and this widespread philosophy is the source of the corruption that threatens ultimately to ruin humankind it was invented it was introduced when there was war in heaven it was fomented by the dragon and his angels you see Satan charged that it is impossible to keep the commandments of God that God's law is precisely what many of our lawmakers and leaders say that it is an unattainable morality and the implication of Satan's rebellion is of course that God is unfair he requires a moral fidelity and and since Satan says it's impossible you hear there you have the conflict between good and evil today the dragon insists concerning marital infidelity and lying well everybody does it so don't feel so bad the Savior who was born in Bethlehem stall has proved that Satan is telling a lie under oath Amen. Romans chapter 8 and verses 3 and 4 tell us the exact truth about how Jesus was born in Bethlehem it says that God sent his son in the likeness of our sinful flesh sent him in our nature and for sin he condemned sin in our flesh and that includes lying that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit this verse declares to us that Jesus walked in perfect fidelity and honesty and uh, marital fidelity 
And it is possible through Jesus Christ. Amen. In fact, infidelity and lies are impossible for the one who walks after the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to walk after the Spirit? It means to say no to our human nature. Amen. No to our human flesh. To say yes to the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's that simple. Two of the Ten Commandments speak of how we use the tongue. How we use our speech. The third commandment says that if we believe the good news of Jesus Christ, we will never be guilty of taking the Lord's name in vain. Amen. And in the ninth commandment, it becomes a wonderful assurance to the one who understands and believes how good the good news is. We can't imagine what our Redeemer has in store for us in helping us to tell the truth and speak the truth through our tongue. The Holy Spirit gives us a, f a few clues, but it is like us and that mother, that mother who gave birth to a blind son, all of us are born into this world blind as to the truth. But the Holy Spirit wants to give us clues as to the light and the color and the clarity of what truth is. Imagine if you lived in a world of darkness. Then you could cut, su suddenly see, suddenly got sight. What a miracle that would be. Your whole world would be revolutionized. Imagine if you lived in a world without taste, and suddenly you could taste a wonderful buffet. Imagine if you lived in a world without sound, and then you could hear beautiful music. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do with those of us who are born into this world with a nature that is not honest. But the Holy Spirit wants to give us clues as to truth and honesty. And so we read in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The entire Bible both the New Testament and the Old Testaments, rightly understood, must be good news, not bad news. And so God is not some kind of a stern lawgiver who is dishing out a series of impossible to obey commands with the penalty of death hanging over our heads. He is a savior from breaking those commandments. He wants to deliver us from death. He has purposed that every human being shall enjoy eternal life for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We read in 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. So Christ is already the Savior of all men. He is your Savior to deliver you from dishonesty and lying. And He is your Savior. He has promised to help you speak the truth and to think the truth. The Lord. Did you notice what it said? Especially, he, Christ is already the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Amen. Especially those who believe. He wants to deliver from this sin of lying. When God the Father sent Jesus Christ to this earth, God gave him a special job description. Go down to that lost world and save it. And so Jesus says, I came to save the world. He's not trying to find a way to shut us out of heaven. Rather, he's trying to prepare us to enter into heaven. And God chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world, having predestinated us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. But isn't there a terrible judgment coming, says someone, when we shall all come under the stern scrutiny of God's law? Yes. But we read, if any man sin, we have an advocate. That's a defense lawyer. An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And if anyone is afraid that this great defense lawyer won't take up his case. Then John adds, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is already your defense lawyer if you don't push him away. There are some criminals on trial that fire their lawyers 
and they lose their cases. Now you are in a judgment hour right now. Don't fire your lawyer, Jesus. Let him hold on to your case. Jesus has become the new head of humanity. He fired that old Adam, which was our first head. You know, Adam, because of his parental responsibilities, really set a bad example and has led us all into sin. And, ha and Jesus, however, has fired that old Adam and taken his place to lead us in paths of righteousness. And so you and I have a birthright that has been given to us in Jesus. And just like Isaac's son, Esau, had the birthright already given to him, nobody in heaven or earth could have deprived Esau of that birthright except his own act of discarding it. And when he sold it for a mere dinner entree, we read, thus Esau despised his birthright. And Paul warns us, don't give in to the subtle temptation to be a fornicator or a profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Wouldn't it be heartrending in the final judgment as we stand before the great white throne of God to realize that God actually gave us the gift of eternal life like he gave everlast like he gave that birthright to Esau, but we sold it for some of the world's tinsel treasures to save us from that ultimate agony. He is today sending us the message of the pure gospel, which is for us good news. And so breaking the ninth commandment is a sin for which many people will lose their souls. But folks, the good news is that Jesus gives salvation from that sin. When God says you shall not bear false witness, he means that we are never to tell even a little white lie. Never to give a false impression, even by a nod of our heads. It forbids all gossip, including damaging the reputation of another person by keeping still when he or she is becoming being accused. If we know something good to say and we keep still, the Holy Spirit preserves us and allows us to speak up, to say something good about that person's reputation. We can bear false witness simply by keeping still when it's possible for us to speak up to save somebody's reputation. And this commandment becomes an assurance that we have a Savior who will save us from breaking it. We are to speak, according to Zechariah 8.16, each man, we are to speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace, we read. All bearing of false witness comes from its true origin. The true origin of false witness, fraud, and lying is Satan. We read in John chapter 8, verse 44, when, when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. The source of all lying is Satan. John 8, 44. Proverbs 12, 22 says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But those who deal truthfully are his delight. Amen. A false witness, scripture says, will not go unpunished. And he who speaks lies will not escape, Proverbs 19.5. We read that God actually hates a lying tongue, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, and a false witness who speaks lies in Proverbs 6. But remember, even though God hates lying, the Bible assures us that he loves the liar and he seeks to save him from his lying. Amen. Amen. And there are dear, there are sincere people who bear false witness and they have no idea what they're doing. No idea what they're doing. And they're among those whom Jesus prayed. He prayed for those 
who didn't know what they were doing when they were lying, when he was on his cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sometimes parents teach little children to tell lies, but God still loves them, but he seeks to enlighten them. Some people are colorblind, that is, they can't tell the difference between a red light and a green light. And as a result of that, they have all kinds of accidents in life. The famous agnostic Thomas Huxley was once lovingly confronted by a very sincere Christian. And this believer stressed to Huxley that he was not in any way impugning Huxley's sincerity. Nevertheless, he said, might it not be possible that mentally you as a great scientist are colorblind? That is, some people cannot see traces of green where other people cannot help but see it. Could it be that this was Huxley's problem? That he was simply blind to truth that was quite evident to others? And Huxley, being a man of integrity, admitted that was very possible. And he added that if it were, he himself, of course, could not know or recognize it. And God is merciful to such people. God is merciful, but better still, he has promised to give the Holy Spirit to those who don't know the difference between right and wrong. He has promised that. He wants to be their teacher. Let them listen to him. And in the day of judgment, ignorance of the truth will be no excuse. But thank God right now, we have another opportunity to learn. We are right now in this going to school with the great teacher, Jesus, who has sent us the Holy Spirit so that we can know the difference between right and wrong. In the last two chapters of the Bible, we have three warnings that tell us that whoever loves and practices a lie will not be able to enter the eternal kingdom. There are lots of books and movies that tell a lie and they're loved by one whose heart is not reconciled to God. And thus we see that not only is it serious to practice a lie, but it is equally serious to love a lie. Long before the lips may utter a falsehood, if the heart is dishonest, we have already sinned. Lord, who may dwell in your holy hill, writes the psalmist in chapter 15, verses one and two. And the answer is he who speaks the truth in his heart. Whoever hides hatred has lying lips, says Proverbs 10, 18, and whoever spreads slander is a fool. In other words, we can smile at someone, slap them on the back, and shake their hand, and yet hide our hatred of them very deeply within our heart. And all of this is breaking the ninth commandment. So what it boils down to is, it is impossible for any of us mortals to obey the ninth commandment unless we are truly converted deep within the heart. Jealousy, jealousy of someone who seems to be prettier or better off than we are, even a desire to see that person fail or fall. All of this happens long before a word is spoken. And we all know how that problem is deep within our own hearts. It's so true, as Romans 3.10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Surely we need to pray, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me. We don't want what Psalm 140 verse 3 says is deep inside everybody, every one of us. It says there is deep within inside of every one of us the poison of snakes under the lips. Oh my, do we ever need a savior from that? And thank God again, we have a savior from that. Can we bear false witness? By saying nice things to somebody? Yes, if we speak flattery, 
saying something nice to someone's face and then snickering behind his back is bearing false witness. A man who flatters his neighbor, we read in Proverbs 29.5, spreads a net for his feet. David tells of the pain that he suffered in Psalm 55, 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, and yet they were drawn swords. What picturesque language. We do not realize how deep this problem is rooted within us. It's so easy to say good morning to someone when in our heart we wish he could get what he deserves. The ninth commandment calls for complete honesty, complete and utter honesty in our dealings with one another. But suppose, suppose you know someone who is doing wrong. How can you be honest and pleasant at the same time? You can pray for him as Jesus prayed for bad people who crucified him, Father, forgive them. But it does not help to rebuke someone unless the love of Christ is in your heart. But if that love is there, the Holy Spirit will tell you, will teach you exactly what to do, and that is both loving and honest. You might be able to help that person, but if not, you can be happy for your own conscience will be clear. The tongue is the instrument that is often the agent in breaking the ninth commandment. Says Proverbs 10, 19, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Be not rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. Let your words be few. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 2. If we sense how easily we are tempted to be deceptive, we can remember the common sense good news of the Apostle James that will save us from just messing up our lives. In James 3, verse 2, he says, If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Ships... Although they, are, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member. How great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And it is set on fire by hell. A match can do both good and evil, depending on the will and the heart of the one who uses the match. There is indeed good news for all of us. The ninth commandment, as we mentioned, is an assurance to the one who believes the introduction to the Ten Commandments, where it says that I am the Lord your God, he reminds us he has already delivered you out of this house of bondage. And it includes our deeply learned habitual breaking the ninth commandment. The Lord has delivered us from our bondage to un dishonesty and untruth. He saves the tongue. He saves your tongue because he first of all saves your heart. Amen. Praise God. Christ came down to this world. He took upon him. Upon his sinless nature, our sinful nature, living as we must live in an evil, in a very corrupt society. And yet he always said no to the temptation to tell lies or even to give anyone a false impression. He met the dragon of sin in its own cave, in its own lair. You know where Jesus met the dragon and is lying? In our flesh. Your flesh and my flesh. That's the lair of sin. And he conquered it. He said no to it. And so what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, he did it. He took our nature with all of its weaknesses. He triumphed over sin in the same nature. And by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. 
And why did he do this wonderful thing? Because of what verse 4 tells us, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so in very simple terms, this means the same thing as the introduction to the Ten Commandments. He has delivered us out of the house, the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and you and I don't have to go on being deceptive in any way. He's promised to make us honest from the depths of our hearts, inside and out. Isn't that a precious blessing? A precious blessing. But someone says, it's so difficult to be honest. It's so difficult to be honest through and through. Why, we live in a world that is filled with deception. And you have to be worldly or you can't get ahead in this world. How can I be so different? And the answer is Jesus himself. Amen. That's the answer. He lived in our same worldly world in a culture that was filled with deception. He could have saved his life at the very end if he had been willing to just keep silent when the high priest demanded of him an answer by oath. The high priest said, I, I want to know, tell us, are you the Son of God? Remember? And Jesus was compelled to give a truthful answer, wasn't he? And it cost him his life by crucifixion. But in so doing, he earned the right to be your Savior and my Savior. There was the story, story of King Saul in the Bible, I think is an encouragement to all of us who feel them, themselves unjustly opposed or even persecuted for their conscience, conscientious beliefs, which they hold in all honesty. Sometimes when you hold conscientious honest, and beliefs in all honesty, you're opposed for that, right? You've experienced that. And, but David was loyal. He was loyal to the principles of church organization. In that, he knew that Israel as a nation must have organization. He knew that it must have a government. And for David in those days, that meant a government must have a king. And his king was King Saul that he honored. And David knew also that the prophet Samuel had, had been anointed by Saul, had anointed Saul, rather, to be Israel's king. Apparently, the approval and the guidance of the Lord was in all of this. And so David humbled himself to believe this, even though King Saul wanted to murder him. Saul became David's enemy, continually we read in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 29. And this was a vexing, severe test for young David, who was either still in his teens or just out of them. But David humbled himself to what he knew was the reality, the facts, that God had anointed Saul to be king over the order and the organization of his church in those days. And so David is a perfect example of, for those who today feel persecuted because of conscientious beliefs, supposedly by the very servants of God. David is an example of upholding church order and organization and being respectful to the leaders. And on one occasion, David, as a fugitive, happened to be hiding in a cave when he should have come in. Uh, on one occasion, David, as a fugitive, happened to be hiding in a cave and when, when who should suddenly come in to this cave to relieve himself but the great King Saul himself. And David was back there in the shadows, in the dark. And David's friends who were hiding with him, with him urged him why don't you seize the day? Seize the opportunity. Because apparently God has given him over to you. Kill your enemy, Saul. You know what David did? He refused to lift his hand against the Lord's anointed. He refused. And so, so loyal was David to the principles of organization 
that he honored this King Saul and the position that God had placed him. And those who face unjust opposition and even persecution in seeking to do what God says will not be forsaken by the Lord. They will not be forsaken. He will permit them, yes, to be tried, even severely so, for the Lord permitted David to have every excuse to believe that the Lord would indeed forsake him. That is, if David wanted to not believe in the Lord, but David held on to his faith in the Lord, and the Lord did not forsake him. Amen. And here is this Lord's solemn promise to those who serve him faithfully today, even in the face of severe opposition and persecution. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And so to the one who values truly important things, are you someone who values honesty through and through? Are you? Amen. Are you someone who values truth through and through? Well, you wouldn't be here if you weren't a Seventh-day Adventist because you're swimming upstream against the current. So you must value truth and honesty None of us has received such a character of honesty and truth. None of us receive that naturally through our genes, through our DNA. Our parents did not pass that along to us. We have to learn that from Jesus. Amen. We have to learn that. He teaches us the truth. And if we don't resist the truth, he leads us into more truth. Such a character... I would say is a gift of God's grace. It has to be imported from heaven. In Zephaniah 3 verse 13, a marvelous little verse tucked away, the remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. That is a marvelous promise, isn't it? A marvelous promise and an achievement. It's an achievement, folks, that really makes Satan angry. It makes him angry. For he believes that it is impossible for any human being to become truly honest. Satan doesn't believe a person can be honest. Don't believe what Satan is telling you to believe. Don't believe it. The book of Revelation describes a people who in the last days have permitted the Holy Spirit to mold them, to teach them, to train them, to be like Christ in character. Amen. That's what the book of Revelation teaches. He sa says, John, in Revelation 14, verse 1, I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion. You know what that is? That is a symbol of the church. And with him 144,000. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. In their mouth was found no deceit, no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Wow. Have a snapshot picture of yourself taken with Jesus on Mount Zion. Can we wash any part of the Word of God down the drain? Can we flush it down? This promise is written here for us to believe it. That's why it's written. This is a people, a group that are different from any others in all of world history because it says also that they sing, as it were, a new song before the throne. You know what a new song is? You write a song when you have a new experience. You, have a, you sing a new song when you've experienced a new thing. And a new experience means that they have received and that they have believed a new message in all of its clarity, a fresh proclamation of the everlasting gospel. And they want to sing about it like no other group has ever sung about it in earth's history. Because it's a wonderful achievement that the gospel has accomplished for them. Yes, 
The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. But there is a clearer proclamation of that gospel. Luther, John Calvin, the good men as they were, struggling amidst the currents that would drag them downstream with the popular Christianity of the day. Those 16th century reformers, they saw much light and they were blessed in their age. And they were a blessing to the world. But in these last days, folks, we are living in the time of the great three angels' messages of Revelation 14 and of that message of the fourth angel of Revelation 18. The everlasting gospel is now more fully revealed in light of the sanctuary truth than it ever has been before. And its purpose is not merely to prepare you and me so we can die and come up in the resurrection, but it is to prepare a corporate body of God's people for translation, seeing Jesus come alive, the second coming. And granted, some will refuse this last day's ministry of Christ as our great high priest, but there will be many who will honor him by permitting the Holy Spirit to work upon their hearts. But these people are sinners by nature, just like you and me. And yes, indeed, they have permitted Jesus to save them from continued sinning. They have no advantage, no education or perks more than anybody else. They have simply seen something and comprehended something that others in past ages could not see. And Paul prayed for us when he said, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And that means to be ready for the glorious second coming of Jesus. Today, there are those three angels that are going everywhere in the world. They are proclaiming a most precious message, and soon a fourth angel will join them, and a voice will sound from heaven in some way to every person in the world. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. And that voice of our Good Shepherd is speaking to you, and it is telling you the good news that Christ has saved you from breaking the ninth commandment. You can be a new person. You don't have to stay in the old, dark, spiritual Egypt. Jesus has set you free Amen. from bondage by his death on the cross. I know that some people say lying isn't so bad. What's bad about lying under oath? But Jesus tells us that we should talk as under a solemn oath all of the time. Matthew 5, 37, let your communication be yes, yes, no, no, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of the evil one. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. I know that conventional wisdom says that it's commonly taken for granted that adulterers will almost automatically lie about it, but God has another wisdom, and it is effective. His Holy Spirit is even now all over the world teaching a people of whom it will honestly be said, in their mouth is no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now don't snicker at that. Don't laugh at that. That's going to be true. Don't wash that promise down the drain. It's in the Word of God for us to believe it. And such Transparent honesty is the fruit of Christ-like love, and it can be realized only as self is crucified with Christ. Would you agree that Jesus is the ultimate truth? He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no hypocrisy in him. If you begin telling a little white lie, what is the consequence of that? It's hard to remember what you said first, isn't it? So the next time around, the story may be just a little bit different. And you have to tell a little bit bigger one, you know. 
and then the next time it comes around it just kind of gets you know out of control little things worm into the life and ultimately they just take over don't they now don't throw a stone at the messenger here this morning but I just say this for your thoughtful consideration that December the 25th is not the birth date of Jesus I don't know maybe there's some people here who believe that It'd be interesting to have a raise of hands so G December 25th is not the birthday of Jesus is it so that's a complete lie you know what December the 21st is it's the winter solstice is it okay and so after that what the days start getting longer the Sun starts to return and so the old pagans used to celebrate the return of the Sun you know the days are getting longer and so they had their pagan holiday on December the 25th and that got absorbed into the popular Christianity in the first few centuries of the early Christian Church and if you let a little lie come in what happens it soon takes over the whole thing doesn't it I can't imagine that Jesus would tell us a, an untruth about his birthday if Jesus wanted to reveal to us what his birthday was would he have written it up for us in the Word of God but you don't find one word in here as to what Jesus birthday is do you and so then it's just better to leave it quiet isn't it people would rather today though talk about the birth date of Jesus rather than the incarnation of Christ who took our sinful flesh and conquered it they'd, they'd much rather talk about the birth date of Jesus than his actual coming in human flesh and conquering sin do you want the true Christ or the false Christ now I'm not here to make anybody feel ashamed as to how you observe Christmas or how you uh, recognize it but just to plant a little seed in your thought in your mind right now receive the Jesus who is the way the truth and the life amen, amen.